Hello, everyone, and welcome to Public Health Musings. I'm your host, Dr. Caroline Kingori at Ohio University. I'm excited that you are able to join us today on another episode of Public Health Musings, and we will be talking about chronic diseases, particularly um, diabetes. I'm happy to be joined by a colleague uh, today, and I'm joined by Dr. Elizabeth Beverly who is an associate professor in the Department of Primary Care at the Ohio University Heritage College of Osteopathic Medicine and the recipient of the Osteopathic Heritage Foundation, Ralph S. Licklider Dio, (laughs) Endowed Faculty Fellow in Behavioral Diabetes. That's so so awesome, um, Dr. Beverly. Um, She's also graduated from the Pennsylvania State University with a Doctor of Philosophy degree in Biobehavioral Health and a minor in Gerontology in 2008. Uh, Also completed a five-year postdoctoral fellowship in diabetes at Harvard Medical School with the Jocelyn Diabetes Center in 2013. Dr. Beverly's research in diabetes focuses on understanding the linkages among psychosocial issues, self-care, and the health outcomes. And she employs mixed methods to examine the culture and context of diabetes self-management in rural Appalachian, Ohio. Welcome, Dr. Beverly. I'm so happy you were able to come and join me on the show today. Thank you so much for having me. Great. So you've accomplished so much within a very short period of time. Um, Tell us your story. How did you get to where you are today? Well, sure. I mean, I don't know if I necessarily think of me accomplishing so much. I see myself as I have a lot of work to still do. Um, But I came to academia. It wasn't necessarily something that I planned on doing since I was a little girl. Um, You know, I I was young and thinking that I would go to medical school and be a physician. Um, But one of the summers when I was doing some work at a local nursing home, over the summer, because going home from college in between, you know, I thought it would be important to have a job and make some money. Um, I, I wasn't too thrilled about the care that I was seeing that the individuals were receiving in the nursing home. And I started getting really interested into aging and aging research. And I kind of, you know, really focus on ageism and advocacy for older adults. And that kind of is what led me to then focus on Hmm, maybe I should pursue doing some research here and then advocacy work, which is what led me to start doing, you know, pursuing a graduate career. But you see now that I'm actually doing diabetes work. So I actually went to graduate school hoping to focus on aging, aging issues. And I really wanted to focus on cognition and with a focus on dementia. But I'm sure you know that when you get into grad school, if your advisor has a grant, you end up doing what your advisor has. And my advisor happened to have a grant in type two diabetes, right as I started. And so she let me know that we would be doing some diabetes research for the next four years. Um, I was, you know, somewhat resistant at the beginning because I wanted to do, you know, dementia. But then I saw some of the connections that diabetes has to every system in the body but I also saw how much it impacts an individual and the family and the friends. And I actually kind of fell in love with that type of research. And so here I am today still doing it. That's awesome. Great story. And you're right. You get to grad school, uh, whoever is paying for that um, journey, that's what you do. And um, I'm sure most of us can, um, you know, agree with you that what we had in mind changed, which is also almost my story as well um, uh, with that, but all ended well. Um, so you, in your bio, you talk about how your research is varied and examines chronic diseases um, such as diabetes through a psychosocial and neurocognitive lens. Um, so tell us more about your research t- trajectory um, with focusing on those, those factors. Sure. So when I describe myself and the research that I do, I like to say that I take a psychosocial lens. I really focus on the psychosocial aspects. Um, When I think back, even to when I was in high school, I've always had a care about people and their quality of life and their mental health. So that's something I've always been passionate about. And then the more and more I learned about diabetes and the impact that it does have on someone's emotional well-being. I knew right then and there that that's what I was going to be focusing on. Um, And I think it's something that we can all relate to. 
we've all had good times in our life. We've all had difficult, challenging times in our life. And the research that's out there with diabetes, people with diabetes, you know, are much more likely to have depression and anxiety and lower quality of life and diabetes distress. And so I feel like that's something that I can contribute to and make a difference for. And it's something I'm also just truly passionate about. I have a lot of friends with diabetes. I have family members with diabetes. It just seems like that's something that I'm drawn to and can make a difference in. So that's, that's sort of what I'm looking at with the, the psychosocial lens. Yeah. Awesome. And it's interesting because even with my area of research, there was that connection, um, you know, with uh, the small niche community and family and also the larger, um, you know, community in, uh, in Africa and the issues with HIV. So I think it happens with a lot of us when we focus on our research that there's always that personal connection um, that motivates us and wants us to make a difference. Um, so when we think about diabetes, you know, we talk about it so much and there's so much information. I have family members who have diabetes, I have friends who have diabetes. And it's interesting you mentioned how they suffer from depression and anxiety. I didn't even think about that. What do we need to know about diabetes in general? So the things to know about diabetes in general, I would say, you know, first and foremost, there are many types of diabetes, more than just two, but there are the two most common types. You have type one diabetes and type two. And just even understanding that there are two types, you know, so type one diabetes, a lot of people think, oh, that's what children get. It, you can actually have type one diabetes at any time point in your life, you know, and there are actually two time points where it's most common. One is in adolescence and then one is in your 60s. So you can really, you can have type one diabetes at any time. And type one, kind of the distinguishing factor is your body's not producing insulin. And you need the insulin because when we eat food, we turn that food into glucose. That's the energy our body uses. And we need that insulin to open the, you know, the door to our cells so that we can store some of that glucose, you know, as energy. And if you're not producing insulin, that just means all that glucose stays in your bloodstream. And basically it just washes out through your kidneys. And so you really need to have storage of glucose in your body. Now, type two diabetes is different than type one. It is where you either don't make enough insulin or the insulin that you have doesn't work as well or as effectively. And so that's when you hear about the insulin resistance. So it's kind of a combination of those. And then it's really important to distinguish the two because there are two different types. And then kind of to understand that type two is the one that's much, much, much more common. So type two probably accounts for 90 to 95% of people with diabetes, not only in the United States, but globally. So most people who have diabetes have type two, but there's still hundreds of thousands of people who have type one diabetes. And it's really important to understand what they have because grouping people together leads to a lot of misinformation. It also leads to a lot of stigma. And so I think just understanding those two things is one of the most important things for diabetes. Wow, that's really well said and well put. And, you know, looking at the context and the communities we work with, um, often we know that underserved communities, as well as rural communities, they suffer from health disparities. And so uh, what impact does uh, diabetes have in those communities, particularly in Appalachia, Ohio, where you work? That's a great question. So I'm going to point out that I'm not from rural Appalachia, and that's key. Um, I'm actually, so I was born in a rural town in Iowa that no, I've never met anybody who's ever known of the town. Now, if I was in Iowa and talking to people, I'm sure people would know, but it was like this little tiny town of Sibula, which I think if you Google it, has like 536 people. So very, very tiny, right? Um, and it's right on the Mississippi River, but that's where I was born. But then I've, you know, lived in many different places. So I've had the opportunity to live in a very, very small rural town, but then I've also lived in Boston, you know, which is a major metropolitan area. So I've had the experience of living in different places, but now here I am in a rural area in Appalachia. And it's important to note that it's a rural region. So I have familiarity with being in a rural area, but I am not Appalachian. And that's key because that means that I'm not part of the culture of this region. And I can do whatever I can to understand the people of this region, but I'm always going to be viewed as an outsider. But it's important to know that what I'm going to be speaking about are things that I've learned and things that people have told me about. 
So when you think about this region, and I'm talking about southeastern Ohio, there is there are a lot of social determinants of health that affect people in this region. And it's the social determinants of health that are leading to some of the health inequities that we're seeing and the disparities that we then see between people who have diabetes and the people who don't have diabetes. And when you look at, for example, the state of Ohio, the most recent CDC data has shown that about 12.4% of people in Ohio have diabetes. Our most recent data from 2016 in this, you know, from Ohio University shows that 19.9% of people in Southeastern Ohio have diabetes. That's five years old and, you know, no research is perfect. So that was a telephone survey, which means we only got people who had access to cell service or phones. I'm guessing the rate of diabetes in this region is close to 33%. It's incredibly high. So to see that there is that disparity between all of Ohio and then you come to the Appalachian region. So we have really high rates. What is the reason for that? I do think that there might be a genetic component. I'm not sure. That's something that no one's really looked at. But when you think about the social determinants of health, you know, the Athens County is still the poorest county in the state, you know, with a poverty rate of about 30.7. We have one of the highest rates of food insecurity. You know, in terms of access to care, we're fortunate that we have a medical school. And because of that med school, we have primary care physicians. But the counties that are surrounding Athens County have limited access to care with primary care physicians. We have limited dental care. And we also have a limited mental health care. And I just mentioned before the importance of, you know, addressing mental health because people with diabetes have increased rates of depression and anxiety and distress. So addressing those things is critical. But if you don't have the access to care, and then anyone who's ever lived in a rural region, you know, people in the urban areas cannot understand this, but you're driving on dirt roads. And not only are they unpaved dirt roads, they are super narrow roads. So sometimes you have to take turns. If you see someone else driving by, you have to pull off on the side to let one person drive through and then you can go. So if you're driving on some of these roads and it rains too much, that road will flood and you might not be able to get to an appointment that you have scheduled. You know, so there's just so many factors. And if you combine all those things together and there's so many other things, um, it just really takes a toll and it contributes to things that we see like diabetes. Wow, that's amazing. Um, and it really translates to some of the issues that are not always um, glaring to researchers um, and even policymakers. And so I commend you for the work that you do and for breaking it down, you know, what those social determinants of health are. Now, you talk about employing a mixed methodology that includes questionnaires and focus groups. Why do you do both? You know, why not just focusing on one? You know, sometimes I, I like the stories, you know, qualitative research. There's so much you learn. Um, takes more time. But then there's a quantitative survey is quick in a hurry. You get, you know, the snapshot data that you need. What is the benefit of employing both of them? Sure, that's a really good question. And I'm going to have a couple of answers for you from a couple of different uh, perspectives. You know, so the first, I mean, the type of research that I love to do really comes down to qualitative. I mean, I'm a huge fan. I like to tell my, describe what I do as, you know, being a storyteller and a truth teller. Um, I really, I think all of us at the end of the day really have a story to tell. And a lot of times we're just not given the opportunity to tell that story. And so for me, I want to be a researcher who gives people that opportunity to share what's going on with them because we all have something to share. The thing is with research, the qualitative is becoming more and more popular, which is fantastic. Now, when I started in grad school, it was not, it was much, much harder to get published it's more mainstream now, but we still favor in the, in the scientific literature, we still favor quantitative research. So that's one of the reasons why I do mixed methods. You know, I do it because I love the qualitative, but I also need to do the quantitative because you need both. To go along with that, I also know that if I'm doing quantitative research, you're limited in what you can ask. You know, so if you have a survey and there is a response set, you know, I might get an indication of what someone's behaviors are 
and what they're doing, but I don't know why they're doing them. So I have to ask them in an interview. So it gives me more information. And then what I'm also going to say is if you're going in academia or if you're in public health, grant funders, private foundations, they like to fund mixed methods. And it's because it gives a complete picture. So there are lots of reasons why I do it. But the real reason, I just love hearing people's stories. And I'm with you on that. Um, I think people's stories just, they really make a difference because one person's story, even though they're in the same community, going through the same issues, even within the same family, they all have different stories because of how they perceive, um, you know, their their environment, phenomenon uh, of the health issue, et cetera. So I know that, um, you know, you've looked at uh, culture, right? And I've looked at culture as well. And that's also another nuance, um, especially with the kind of research that we do, um, psychosocial research, and trying to understand, you know, the meaning behind why people behave the way they do. So how does culture play a role in health behavior in the context of Appalachia, which is where you're working with, um, communities you're working with? Mm -hmm. That's a really good question. And it's a big question. I'm not going to say that I have figured out the answer about Appalachian culture and how that intermixes with behaviors and then how that influences chronic disease. It's something that I'm working on. I think it's really important to recognize that Appalachia is this huge region. It's like 205,000 square miles, 13 states. And when you think about this region, there are going to be different pockets with different cultures. You know, they might be similar, but we do divide up Appalachia based off of kind of where they are located in different regions. So I'm kind of focused on the North Central region, which is where we are in terms of uh, like Southeastern Ohio, a little bit of Pennsylvania and a little bit of West Virginia. So the things that I have done to kind of understand this group, I've done a lot from the provider's perspective. And some of the reason I wanted to do that is with the providers, just hearing their perspectives about what they see in the clinics. And providers also give you that rich description that I'm looking for. And it's somewhat of an observer perspective. So when I've seen and heard about from the provider perspective is really focusing that you there's a lot of mental illness and trauma Now, and that's somewhat of a negative that's focused on, but it's an important thing to take into consideration, just like those social determinants of health. And in fact, mental health can be considered a social determinant of health. The other thing that's really related to what I do, and it's it's fatalism, specifically diabetes fatalism. And that's something that I've really noticed, not only from the providers, but also people in the region. And that's a lot of people in this region have diabetes. So they, you'll see a family where the grandmother has it, the grandfather has it, the aunts and the uncles have it, the parents have it, siblings have it. So when someone has everyone in their family with diabetes, they think it's inevitable and they think that that's their future and that there's nothing they can do to prevent it. And so they just accept that this is what's going to happen to them, which ultimately affects some of the behaviors that they're doing because they think, well, I shouldn't bother to do physical activity or I can eat what I want. It's gonna happen to me anyway, look at everyone in my family. But there is a lot of work out there that has a lot of positive things to focus on. And that's something that we really need to kind of be moving towards. And some of those things would be, there's a lot of generous people in this region and I've never seen anything like it in all the different places that I've lived. The community would really rally behind each other. You know, if you see somebody down and struggling, you know, people will stand up for that individual and come to their rescue. And so this Appalachian community is very, very generous. It's also a caregiving community. And you can definitely see how much caregiving and the matriarch and the role of the matriarch plays in this region. And I've also seen a lot of pride that's taken through self-reliance and independence and really making sure that, you know, someone can do these things on their own. And that can translate into trying to do your own self-care and manage diabetes on your own. So there's just a lot of wonderful cultural values that I've also seen while doing some of my work. 
That's amazing. Um, and it's always good when we see that the rest of the community members, family, friends are involved. You know, if you're thinking of the um, coming up with an intervention, the social ecological model, and not just focusing on the individual. And when you talk about the fatalism, it really just you know, brings home that idea that there's still so much more that we need to know about this individual behavior and the environmental um, and behavior, the environmental factors that influence their behaviors and how not to put the burden of behavior change on an individual, right? It takes, literally takes a village um, for that to work. And as you are talking about those risk factors, you know, you've published extensively on other risk factors associated with diabetes and chronic diseases like cardiovascular diseases. Um, what do we need to know about how to address these risk factors? So some of the risk factors that are related to cardiovascular disease and diabetes. So you think of diet. So in this region, we've already mentioned that there are higher rates of food insecurity. So if you're having problems knowing that when you're getting, where your next meal is coming or not having enough food to make ends meet for the rest of the month, those issues might lead to individuals purchasing items that are going to be things that will have a longer shelf life, you know, rather than fresh foods, you know, just because you, those foods tend to be cheaper, but they also last long. Okay. And one of the things with that is that that then leads to some of the other factors like increased body size, which can then lead to increased BMI, which leads to cardiovascular disease and type 2 diabetes. So thinking about those things, so healthy diet is a big issue, right? But of course, the rural nature and the social determinants effects, all of that is related to it. Physical activity, that's another one. That's one of those risk factors. And in the Southeastern Ohio region, physical activity and sedentary rates are much higher compared to other parts of the state and the nation, which is also interesting. And so what I haven't figured out and I haven't teased out yet, you know, I, I'm not an exercise physiologist, so I pass this torch in someone at your college. But, you know, are there some cultural beliefs about physical activity in this region? That's not something I've explored or I'm not aware of anyone else exploring, but that would be really interesting to look to see if that's something. Um, and then one of the big ones, which I know some people have done, is smoking and tobacco use. So smoking and tobacco use are very high in this region. And so that's a risk factor for type 2 diabetes as well as cardiovascular disease. And so those are some of the, the three most important things for chronic disease. And those are the things that are much higher in our region compared to the state and the nation. And that's why we have so many disparities and so much higher rates of chronic conditions in this region. And I also think that affects the quality of life and the mental health. Wow. Um, again, I keep learning so much um, where diabetes is concerned. Um, you know, my grandparents, my, you know, my mom, well, it is also um, also has diabetes, and so it's always interesting to see how um, she tries to mitigate and deal with um, the impact, and um, trying to reduce and ensure that she's taking the right medication, and all the work that goes into that. And you you brought on the neuro um, neurological effect of diabetes, and I just wanted to have you talk a little bit more about that and what depression, anxiety, men, you know, other mental health issues, how does that happen and what can be done um, to deal with that as well? Sure. That's a really important question. I think society is getting a lot better talking about mental health, which is fantastic. And I hope that means that with our younger generations like Gen Z, that it just means that their futures will be much better because we'll be much more open. So with diabetes, psychosocial issues are much higher. So this is all compared to the general population. So people with diabetes, and it doesn't matter what type, have two to four times more likely to have depression. That's a lot higher. If you're, if, I mean, the range is, if you might be four times more likely to have depression, that is so much higher. In terms of anxiety, the prevalence is about one in five people with diabetes will have generalized anxiety disorder. Again, incredibly high. For diabetes distress, now I will point out, you have to have diabetes in order to have diabetes distress. 
because the emotional distress is coming from having and living with diabetes. So it's like the frustrations you have with self-care, worries about complications, worries about, you know, what's going to happen in the future with your diabetes, and even, you know, concerns you might have about the cost of care or even the quality of medical care you get, that's all tied into diabetes distress. Diabetes distress, you know, the prevalence is, this is for severe distress, the prevalence for that is, you know, about, you know, 30 to 40%. That's incredibly high, you know, and there are some other issues that aren't as high. There are a couple of eating disorders that tend to be more prevalent. And so for example, for people with type two, they're more likely to have binge eating disorder. And if you think about it, that's one that would make a little bit more sense. Um, but it's something that anyone in public health should be aware of. And that's something that should be addressed, particularly with anyone who's going into dietetics. That's something to really focus on. For people with type one, uh, there's a specific type of eating disorder where it's insulin omission. And that is referred to in the lay literature as diabulimia. So if you omit taking your insulin, you will lose a dramatic amount of weight. And this is because you're not putting any glucose into your cells. So what you're actually doing is all the food that you are consuming, none of that is being stored in your body. So you're actually urinating all of that glucose out. So you can, you, you can actually lose a dramatic amount of weight, but is incredibly dangerous because that means all that glucose is in your bloodstream so that you have really high levels of glucose in your blood. And it is very damaging to have high blood glucose levels. And so that can actually damage, you know, your cells, which can lead to all those complications. And so that's why it's really scary when people talk about, you know, not being able to feel parts of their fingers or, you know, their toes or having problems with their eyesight. It's because of that glucose damaging some of those cells, the vasculature, you know, and it's because of those high levels of blood glucose. So it's really dangerous to do and it's really hard to treat. The other thing that I would say in terms of the, you know, thinking of the neurocognitive is that for people with diabetes, again, type one or type two, all types of dementia are higher. So regardless of whether you have type one or type two, you have higher rates of dementia. And as you age, we also know that you have higher rates of dementia. So people with diabetes have increased rates because as they age, they also have an increased chance of having dementia. So it's just, there's a lot going on. Um, and that's why we need to, you know, really be out there and put a lot of support, but also address this because mental health is something that we can address and it's something that we can fix and it's not a normal part of diabetes. So if someone is struggling with mental health, there is treatment out there for it because you should not be depressed and have diabetes. You should not be incredibly anxious and have diabetes, there are ways to get better from that. That's amazing information. I can only imagine how much it takes. You know, they have to prick themselves every morning um, and check their glucose level. Um, and then sometimes you're doing everything right and your insulin is not be behaving, you know, so it's likely for people to get frustrated and, you know, suffer from this distress. And so thinking of that, you know, outside of the distress, what are some of the other barriers that an individual's ability to follow diabetes um, treatment prescriptions? What, what are the barriers do they face? And what recommendations do you have for them and their families as well as the providers? Sure. So we've already mentioned a lot of the barriers for social determinants of health. We've already mentioned the mental health concerns. So some of the other barriers really, you know, focus on support. So lack of social support is actually a social determinant of health, but people don't always think of it that way. But social support is incredibly important with diabetes. And some of that comes from friends. Some of that comes from your work environment. Some of that comes from your family that you're involved in. As you mentioned earlier, diabetes does not happen to one person. It happens to the whole family. And the whole family has to be on board. And so social support is so key. And with this new social media age that we're in, in some ways that social media has been very helpful for the diabetes community because there are a lot of social media groups. 
And it's been fantastic for a lot of people because you can, you know, you can ask questions, you can share information, but you can have these friend groups. And a lot of people with diabetes have these groups online. It's like a form of peer support, which is incredibly helpful because I could tell someone all of the information that I've learned, but I don't know what it's like to have diabetes. So what does it really matter? Right. I'm just reciting facts that I've learned over time. But if I did have diabetes and I could connect with someone one on one about, oh, do you know what this feels like when this happens? You know, we'd have that shared bond. And that just means so much. You know, so finding that support and then telling the family members and friends, you know, hey, you need to be a part of this, too. And it's going to be good days and bad days. Right. So you kind of need to be that cheerleader to help. And you're going to have good days and bad days too, right? But it is so important to have that social support. That is one of the factors that leads to better outcomes, hands down, all the research points to, and improves quality of life. It's just so important in terms of all of the outcomes to have the social support. I definitely agree with you. Um, Anything that has to do with a chronic disease, it's important to know that there are other people who are going through the same thing like you are. Um, I think sometimes the challenge is though that person who has diabetes or cardiovascular diseases reaching out, you know, and wanting to receive that social support, um, depending on what kind of distress they're facing um, as they go through that um, challenge. So I know you published last year a paper that looked at um, improving knowledge about hypoglycemia. Do you, do you say hypoglycemia or hypoglycemia and glucogen <laughs> among school personnel in rural southeastern Ohio? Now, you know, we sort of were talking more like adults, but now we, you know, when we think about young people, what do we need to know about the risk of uh, the risk factors for diabetes in that population compared to adults? Sure. So that's that study came about from students at Ohio University. So there's a student group on campus. We, it's called DOSES. It stands for Diabetes Outreach Support and Education for Students. That's why DOSES sounds way better because it's, it's a lot of words and they're big words. Um, and this is a student group that includes you know, students on campus who have diabetes and also students who are very committed to supporting others with diabetes. They may have friends and family who have diabetes. And I'm, I'm one of the faculty mentors who's part of this DOSES group. And I'd just been hearing a lot of stories from students about how, you know, some friends, some maybe some faculty were just not aware of what hypoglycemia was or how to react to hypoglycemia. And so I thought, well, you know, hypoglycemia can occur at any time. And if we have people in like the classroom who have no idea what to do and it becomes a severe low, this is a major medical emergency. We need somebody to respond. So I thought, perhaps this is something that, you know, we can do, you know, we can create this brief little intervention and I just wanted to test it out. So I tested this out with some med students and I also tested it out. You know, I had um, a postdoc tested out in one of the local school districts. And so we just created this, you know, brief little presentation about hypoglycemia, talking about glucagon administration. And I did it with med students. My colleague, Rochelle Rennie, she did it with the school personnel. And for both of those things, we just, we showed that we were able to increase knowledge immediately about hypoglycemia and glucagon administration. It's, it's actually quite daunting to look at glucagon. And if anyone knows what glucagon in is, it's when someone is in a severe low, almost appears to be either having a seizure or in a coma. That's, it's something that you have to inject. This is a major medical emergency. And it's scary knowing that you're the person then who's going to be injecting it. They do have a new glucagon on the market that is nasal. So you can actually, you know, use it. It's kind of like, you know, um, if you had a saline spray in your nose. So much, much more, less daunting to do that. But before it was a pen that you had to mix a solution and then inject it with a very long needle. And I can tell you, I've never done that for anybody. I would be very scared to do that. So we were showing people how to do that. And I think just showing people and saying, like, this is how you would do it. um, It meant a lot to see that that demonstration. And we actually have created now a virtual reality simulation. And we're going to make it a website so we can share it to anyone who wants to see it. So hopefully that will save a few lives someday. 
Nice. Yeah. So why not talk about that virtual reality simulation? Um, you know, nice segue to that. <laughs> um, I'm always very interested in how we utilize technology in health and to influence um, health behavior. I'm having something similar in a different project, but I want to hear about your, your work with, um, you know, artificial intelligence or, you know, what, whatever kind of technology you have and the huge grant you received to, to help with that kind of work. Sure. So I've started doing work in virtual reality, which if you had asked me a few years ago, I mean, I'm not even sure I knew what virtual reality was because I'm not very techie. Um, the reason I got into virtual reality is actually has to do with your colleagues in college health science and professions. So your colleagues have done some virtual reality. This grant happened to come together. I happened to be a diabetes person and we were going to do something on diabetes. So that's how it all worked out. But this grant with the Ohio Department of Medicaid combined you know, six colleges at the university. And it really highlights the work out of the GRID lab, which is the game research and immersive design lab. And they're just phenomenal. You know, they're the ones who make the, major, the amazing virtual reality. And, you know, I just get to put my name on it. You know, I, I inform some of the, the science and medical stuff, but they create this beautiful project. And then what I do with it is I do the research with it. So I have now done a few of them. One of them was to address bias in Appalachia with type 2 diabetes. So we really wanted to focus on some of the misconceptions and stereotypes people have about the region. And we also wanted to focus on social determinants of health in the region and show how some of this bias and the social determinants of health are leading to the disparities that we see with diabetes. And so it, it, it's just a phenomenal piece of work that the Grid Lab put together. And I worked with College Health Science and Professions. We had this great curriculum put together. We are still doing research on it. So we have lots of studies that we're still working on with students. Yeah. And it's just been fantastic. Good. And I'll dig deep into that a little bit. When you think about it, how does virtual reality intertwine with health behavior? And then we'll talk a bit about the implicit bias as well. So for the type of virtuality that I'm using, and there, it's important to say there are many types of virtual reality. So the type that we're using, they have kind of created on their own and they call it cinematic virtual reality. So what they're doing is they are bringing in all of the techniques of cinema and we've all seen movies, right? So what they do is they use the 360 degree virtual reality, but they film the movie. So you get to see this amazing movie and then you get to look around the room and you get to be the fly on the wall in a movie. But what we're filming is in the context of health. So it's a person with a health condition and you get to see the behaviors, you get to see the home environment, you get to see the interactions with the healthcare providers and you just get to be there. And what you do is you see a glimpse of things that you would never have seen before. So you get to see what they're doing. And the thing that's really unique about it is we have script writers who come in and write this beautiful storyline. So it's very engaging is you see the things that people tend to hide from providers, you know, and if you think about it, I'm sure there are things we're all hiding from providers, right? So you get to see that and then you kind of understand why they're hiding those things, but then you see how the interaction goes and then you see how much is left out of that interaction. And you see all the pieces that would be helpful to say to the provider. And so you get to see all the barriers. Those barriers affect why they can't do those behaviors. Oh, they can't afford their medications. That's why not they're not refilling their, pre their prescriptions. It's because, you know, their car broke down. All the money had to go to fix the car. So you get to see all these pieces connect together where if you're a provider, you might only see that they didn't fill their prescriptions. So it's just... It's just a really great experience. Indeed, I totally like that whole idea of immersing people into what other people are facing. Um, you know, when we talked about qualitative research, we're great at listening to those stories and then trying to translate them and build all these themes and say, here's, you know, this rep represents knowledge, etc. But when we bring the community members and they have this 360 view of what really actually happens with someone who's, you know, who has this chronic diseases, I feel like it changes the perception 
of providers, but also changes the perception of the community members um, uh, and, and to see how in real life, what it takes for people to manage um, their health issues. So, and yay to the Grid Lab, I'm working with them yeah. as well. <laughs> magicians is what I call them. Yeah. It's amazing. I am looking forward to seeing what you produce out of that. Um, so a little bit about the implicit bias that you talked about. Um, what kinds of implicit bias have you found in your research that hinder adequate provision of diabetes care in Appalachia? You talked about you know, some of those preconceptions that people have, but is there anything else you would want us to know? Yeah. I think if you think about the bias towards people in Appalachia, and I think if we're all being really honest with ourselves, how people in Appalachia are portrayed in the media, and I mean media broadly, so this is movies, TVs, literature, you, know, you have the stereotypical hillbilly, or you have um, individuals who are portrayed as people living in the mountains, and they're portrayed as being extremely poor, um, maybe unhygienic or very low educated. And while there is poverty in this region, you know, there's a lot of financial insecurity, but there's financial insecurity across you know, the whole United States and globally. I think to then see that one picture or that one image or take that one movie and then to equate it with the entire region, that's, that's the issue. That's the stereotyping. Um, the things that I have tried and I've tried to focus on, the education, people thinking that anyone here from this region is uneducated or is stupid. And those that is absolutely not the case. Um, we tend to equate intelligence with the number of years of education that you've had. And I think that's something that we really need to change. So it's great that you and I have decided to stay in school forever and get PhDs. That's just something. And you know why? It's because I was, I just happened to be good at it. If I was good at basketball and six feet tall, I would have done that too, right? I was not. So I didn't do it. But people have so many different skill sets, you know, and if being in school is not your skill set, then you find a different, different route. And not necessarily achieving a bachelor's degree or additional you know, education does not mean that you're not incredibly intelligent and incredibly smart. And so that's one of the things that I've really tried to, to focus on in terms of bias. And the, the generosity is another one. You might not have much in terms of money or possessions, but this is an incredibly generous culture that will do anything to help you if you need it even if they have very little to give. And so those, those are some of the things that I've really tried to focus on. I love how you, you know, are an advocate at heart, right? Even with your own research, um, trying to make a difference. And you and I work with very distinct groups of people, immigrants, refugees, you're working with Appalachia. And there are all these um, stereotypes that people behold uh, with these distinct groups. And so I think it's a great thing that when we are able to bring a different story, um, I think that's why I like doing qualitative research with those small groups because they they have nuances that even you, me as an immigrant, I'm like, wow, I didn't even think about that. Um, and I think it's really fascinating. So that's, that's really wonderful. Now, have you seen any improvement uh, with patient provider interaction after getting them, you know, with uh, exposed to this VR experience and any health outcomes changes too? So we have done research and we have shown that we have changed providers' attitudes towards diabetes. So we've improved their attitudes so that they recognize how serious it is and that they also recognize that the patient should have a little bit more ownership in their diabetes and shared decision-making. And then we've also changed the attitude that providers now understand better the emotional connections with diabetes so that they pay attention a little bit more, which is fantastic. We've also done a little bit of research to show that we've improved cultural self-efficacy. So what is that, right? So we've done, there are a couple of surveys out there that measure cultural self-efficacy. One of them is, it's a transcultural self-efficacy tool. And that one, what we've shown is it improves someone's knowledge 
about culture, someone's awareness of their own culture, and that other people come from different cultures. It has increased knowledge about social determinants of health and how to ask people about those. And it's also addressed that it's improved individuals' ability to understand that there are other cultures, but the US healthcare system has not necessarily addressed or perfectly fit, you know, how the healthcare system is somewhat broken and that we don't necessarily aren't, isn't created to address all the different cultural, um, to address all the different cultures for the people living in the United States today, but how they have the power within themselves to do that. So we've shown that we can improve cultural self-efficacy. What we haven't done is we haven't looked at health outcomes with the patient population. And so that's something that is down the road that we'd really like to do because that's what matters. Indeed. Um, and I like that there's that survey, right? You called it transcultural efficacy? Yeah, yeah I'll send it to you. Yes. Um, I, culture is at the heart of what I do. And and I see synergies too uh, with the work that I do. I know in the populations I work with, diabetes is a big issue as well. Um, so using VR, we're both doing the same thing. So I'm excited that we're having this discussion and I hopefully we can be able to collaborate um, in the future with uh, the, this other populations that I work with. So as we start winding down, what are the policy implications of the work that you have been engaging in? You know, um, have you written any policy papers? Have you been able to call upon policymakers and provide your feedback to them? What kind of um, implications do you see? Uh, I have not done any policy papers. Uh, what I have done is there is a health collaborative in the state of Ohio that is the cardiovascular health collaborative. We call it CardiO. So like it's C-A-R-D-I and then dash O-H for Ohio. So it's pretty clever. I did not come up with it. But this, this collaborative works with, you know, uh, the um, Ohio Department of Medicaid. And this region has a lot of individuals on Medicare, Medicaid. So what we've been able to do for this health collaborative is if we work with Medicaid managed care plans. And so some of the things that I do is I collect information from providers and from people in, across the state and what they're seeing and what they need. So I do needs assessments with cardio to see, okay, what are the barriers that providers are facing? So I'm able to address like, okay, what are the needs providers have? You know, do they have needs with obtaining home blood pressure monitors? Do they have issues with getting a home glucometer for people with diabetes? I get this information, we share this with Medicaid. Medicaid has made changes based off of some of this information. I'm not gonna say I'm the person who made the change. I'm the person with helping with the data but I'm a part of the change. Um, so that's, I would say my role so far today, but being a part of this collaborative and it's all seven medical schools in the state of Ohio that are a part of it. It's just, and there's a website for it. It's cardio.org. It's just, it's a fantastic thing. If anyone's at all interested, you know, the mission behind it is to take people all across the state from all different, you know, clinical backgrounds and then some social scientists. We're taking what we know in our expertise, and we're trying to accelerate learning to providers across the state. And then we're working with Medicaid to then take what the providers need and share that with Medicaid so that they're getting the message and making the appropriate changes. And so we have seen a lot of changes, like they're covering diabetes, uh, self-management, education, and support now, which is fantastic. So there have been a lot of changes. And I just feel like I'm a part of that group. So it's always nice when we can make a difference. Um, and I think the work that you're doing is amazing. Um, I know there's a time there where insulin became such a hot topic, right? Uh, politically. And I'm like, why is it so expensive? So are you able to shed light on that? And if Medicaid, probably, what are they considering uh, in terms of that? So insulin is... I mean, I cannot tell you exactly why it, you know, they've been so expensive. So what happens is you have these different pharmaceutical companies that produce insulin and 
my understanding is the pharmaceutical ind the industry, they might be behind a certain insulin, but they will then contract through, you know, a certain facility that's producing it. And so because that facility is then making it for that pharmaceutical company, that is what is raising the price. And that's why you're seeing some of these high prices. And the thing, some of these new insulins, where there are new insulins coming out and they are much better than the old insulins. So if it's new and it doesn't have a generic yet, it's gonna cost a lot more. And so that's part of the issue. Um, and that, that's what you see anyway with any new medication. I think there has to be a certain number of years that has to be on the market before you can have, before you can have a generic made of it. This is where I would ask the pharmacists if anyone's listening, and then they can just add that in the chat. I do, I do not know that specifically, but um, that's what has to happen. In terms of what Medicaid is covering for insulin, I, I'll be honest, I really don't know. It, it's definitely an issue. It's something that they is being talked about. Um, it really has to do with the individual care plan. And it's a huge issue. Right. And again, when you think about those barriers um, with people not having access in terms of, you know, they can't afford this if they don't have health insurance, and then it's which type of insulin are you going to be given, the generic or the other one? Um, and I, that adds to the complexities, again, of people adhering to, you know, the medication plan that they have provided or the treatment plan, as you said. So there's still so much work that needs to be done. Um, so, Towards the end, uh, you know, when you're thinking about everything that you've achieved and the work you've done, what is your most memorable moment in your work, in your life to date? To date? Um, you know, I, I think about that and I feel that all along my path, I've always set tiny little goals. And for me, it's when I hit those tiny little goals, you know, so like I remember when I was in grad school, it was my dream to publish in diabetes care, which was a big journal at the time. So when I published my first paper in diabetes care, it was like the biggest deal, right, for me. And at, at the time, it wasn't that looking back, I'm like, people would be like, whatever. But for me, it meant a lot. And then when I was at my postdoc, knowing that I could be you know, hired on a tenure track position and then getting that. And then for me, it was getting tenure. And so for now, what I'm focused on, I, my ultimate goal is to be a full professor. You know, that, that's what I, I really want my best moment to be. It's always to achieve that would be something fantastic. Awesome. And I would say from where I am standing, I can see that path coming along really soon and I'm sending all the good vibes your way. So you talked a lot about your graduate journey and I have a lot of graduate students who listen to this podcast. What's the one or two advice you would give them as they carry on and, you know, as they try to achieve their goals um, within their careers? So I. I'm one of those individuals who loved grad school. I still look back at it and think of it as like some of the best years of my life. And sometimes I, I wish I could go back. It was just a wonderful time for me. And I know there are nights where you stay up late and you're, you know, this whole dissertation thing is overwhelming and when will it be done? My best piece of advice for anyone in grad school, and I hope this is not the wrong message, you just need to have things be good enough, right? So the best piece of advice, and this is even somebody who's on tenure track, when you're writing a paper, there's no such thing as perfection. You could, I could work on a paper for 10 years to try to make it perfect, and it'll never happen because I could always come up with a better sentence. There'll be new literature to put in. It just has to be good enough. And then you send it out. Now, I'm not saying you, you do mediocre work but it just needs to be good enough because you, when you send out a paper, you will get your reviews back and that will make it better too. So it's giving up on that idea of being perfect, you know, and most people who go in grad school, you know, were in perfectionists in high school, perhaps perfectionists in undergrad. And it's one of those things that do your best to try to let that go and just be in the moment and enjoy what you're doing and good enough 
is great. It really is. I like that. Good enough is great. <laughs> and we will end on that note. And to say thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule, um, you know, working on that VR, I can't wait to see that, uh, and to speak to us uh, about your journey and about, uh, you know, the chronic disease, the diabetes, and a little bit about that cardiovascular disease. Um, and I hope to, you know, talk to you again as I follow your work. And I want to thank the listeners and the viewers uh, for tuning in and to encourage all of you to subscribe to all the platforms that you get this podcast on. And uh, yeah, wishing everyone happy holidays and a happy new year as well. Thank you so much, Dr. Beverly. Mm-hmm.